The United Nations warns that the Earth is now in an era of global boiling. Today, the World Meteorological Organization and the European Commission's Copernicus Climate Change Service are releasing official data that confirms that July 2023 is set to be the hottest month ever recorded in human history. The consequences are clear and they are tragic. Children swept away by monsoon rains, families running from the flames, workers collapsing in scorching heat. And for scientists, it is unequivocal. Humans are to blame. All this is entirely consistent with predictions and repeated warnings. The only surprise is the speed of the change. The era of global warming has ended. The era of global boiling has arrived. The air is unbreathable, the heat is unbearable, and the level of fossil fuel profits and climate inaction is unacceptable. Countries all over the world have reached record-breaking temperatures this summer, but the summer they faced is nothing like the videos you're seeing here. The answer is it's pretty bad. It's about 102 degrees Fahrenheit here in Rome. It's about 2 p.m. And it's going to be get, get worse uh, tomorrow. The temperature expected, the forecasted is about 118, 119. The reporter goes on to state that the heat wave is affecting countries that aren't used to these extreme temperatures, nor do they have the infrastructure for it. This is certainly the case in the UK, where although we haven't seen the heat, we do know that our homes and buildings aren't built for it. Whereas warmer countries like the Americas and countries with a more tropical climate incorporate air conditioning, pools and heat deflecting infrastructure, which is why houses in Spain tend to be white, the UK builds homes with the intention of keeping heat in, as is the case with countries like Germany that have suffered with this kind of heat. But that doesn't mean that residents of the UK haven't felt the effects. Just ask our scouts. <laughs> But the heat isn't all there is to worry about. With extreme heat comes extreme rainfall. Here's a quick video that explains it all. When the sun heats up the surface of the sea, water becomes water vapour and rises up in the air. This is called evaporation. As the water vapour gets higher and higher, it cools to form clouds. This is called condensation. When the water droplets in a cloud become heavy enough, they fall as rain, snow or hail. This is called precipitation. Now that we know where the rain comes from, here are three main causes of flooding. Pay attention to the last one he mentions. The first results from overflow. After heavy rain, a river can burst its banks the water can engulf entire valleys far from the precipitation zone. Other tributaries add to the flow of water, worsening the deluge further downstream. The second type of flooding involves the accumulation of water in lowlands or basins. In normal weather conditions, water is absorbed into the ground and merges with the water table. When the ground is saturated, water builds up in low-lying areas. Runoff then quickly fills the valley and its waterways. The third type is caused by urbanisation in flood-prone areas. Excess water passing through drainage systems can accumulate in low-lying zones. This effect is worsened by the coverage of land with buildings and impermeable surfaces such as concrete. Earlier this week, the state of Alaska found out just how bad the effects of flooding can be on urbanised areas. Watch as the raging rapids of the Mendenhall River erode the banks in Juneau, triggering the destruction. This giant tree toppling into the rushing water before being swept downstream. Officials tonight issuing an emergency declaration, blaming the flooding on the rapid melting of the Mendenhall Glacier. Experts say Alaska is warming at twice the rate compared to the rest of the country. That warming contributing to this unprecedented flooding event. The big question is, what does this actually mean? It's, it's all well and good saying that there's climate change and there's climate boiling, but what does it actually mean and what can we do about it? Sadly, we've moved past the area of banning plastic straws and plastic cutlery, and now it's on the people in power to take action and do something about it. You've probably seen in the last few weeks or last few months, Just Stop Oil putting roadblocks in and trying to gain attention to their cause to get the government to do something about climate change.
It's time to pick a side. We don't have time to waste anymore. Why were you arrested? For sitting down with my friends after they painted a building. I didn't do anything. I sat on a pavement. And now I've got a bit of orange paint on me and apparently that's a crime now. Because the people in that building make decisions which are killing people around the world. It is destroying the lives of people in Uganda. The problem seems to be that their methods alienate the public from their cause. If you alienate the public from the cause, then you alienate the public from the issue of climate change altogether. Take a look at these videos. really interesting here when a YouTuber called Josh Peters steps in. You might know him from awarding Katie Hopkins the Campaign to Unify the Nation Award, but this video is something different altogether. So we had a mole working in Just Up Oil for about a week. Uh, so we were on all their secret c communication groups. They use an app called Signal so that the police can't get involved. And we sent our mole protesting and then they had this big banquet. So we, we, we got there just as their harpist was playing some tunes and a 100% plant-based meal was being served. We sent four actors with large orange balloons and very loud alarms. And it's 42 feet, as you say, so it's, it's really quite hard to get them down. Are, are you seriously against them? Do you think that they are wrong in what they do? Or is this part of your approach, which is being I, pranksters? I think they're well-intentioned, and uh, I just think that they've lost their way slightly. It was interesting. Mm. What our mole said to us after sort of being amongst them was it seemed that they were more interested in being rebels and their group that they'd formed, which felt like it was them against the world. Mm. And they were becoming more interested in being arrested and wow. becoming the sort of face of a rebellion rather than actually wanting to tackle mm. climate change. They would then, before going out to protest, they would ask for a show of hands who wanted to be arrested that day. So they know that they get warned by the police with the Section 28 notice and then they wait until it's time to be arrested and the people who want to be arrested then stay on the road instead of clearing off the road after the police warn them and those people then get arrested and go spend the night in jail. So the intention is very much we are going to get arrested today. I'm not sure what that's achieving. I know it's costing the police a huge amount of money mm -hmm. but that seems to be the tactic that Just Up Oil are going for. Point here is their tactics aren't doing anything to solve climate change, and if they carry on and the public keep being put off the cause, which polling shows that it is, mm. climate change isn't going to be solved. While all this might sound terrifying, the good news is that governments are working hard to reduce the impact of climate change and reach net zero targets by 2050. Let's hear from politicians across the world and across the spectrum to see what they have to say. I care about net zero. I've got two young kids. I care about leaving them the, an environment and a climate in better state than we found it and I found it in. Um, but we're going to do that in a proportionate and in a pragmatic way. But on this question of North Sea licenses, I 100% believe that what I'm doing is right. I'll tell you why. If you listen, look at the independent forecasts and estimates, even when we meet our net zero target in 2050, around a quarter of our energy will still come from fossil fuels. I don't think people quite realise that, right? But that's the case. So then the question you have to ask yourself is, given that, wh where would we prefer to have that energy come from? 
I'm, I'm pretty clear that it's better to have it from here at home. Why? Because it's better for our security. So we're not more reliant on foreign dictators like Vladimir Putin. It's good for our economy and jobs. We just had a question about how do we support businesses? Well, 200,000 people are employed in that industry, thousands of businesses, and I'd like to support them. It's also good for our NHS. You asked about that earlier, Nick, because you know what? That generates an enormous amount of tax revenue that we can use to pay for the NHS. And lastly, and for Sarah, it's good to, for us to talk about this as well. It's better for the environment. Because if I have to get that energy but, from halfway around the world and ship it here, it will come with three or four times the carbon emissions. So any which way you look at it, the right sensible thing to do is to use the energy we have here at home as we transition to net zero, which we are going to do. But this is a part of doing that and doing it properly. Some nation is going to lead the world in offshore wind. Why not this one? Some nation will win the race for new hydrogen power. Why not us? Some nation will become a clean energy superpower. Why not Britain? Experts say extreme heat is already costing America $100 billion a year and hits our most vulnerable the hardest, seniors. People experiencing homelessness who have nowhere to turn. Disadvantaged communities that are the least able to recover from climate disasters. And it's threatening farms, fisheries, forests, that so many families depend on to make a living. But none of this is inevitable. From day one of my administration, we've taken unprecedented action to combat the climate crisis that's causing this. We're using the American Rescue Plan to help states and cities promote energy efficiency, reduce flooding, and open cooling centers. We're delivering over $20 billion from the bipartisan infrastructure law to upgrade the electric grid to withstand stronger storms and heat waves. We've launched heat.gov. Go online, heat.gov, to share life-saving information that you may need to know about. In the last year, investment in large-scale solar and wind projects increased by nearly 50%, with 4.3 gigawatts of large-scale renewables to be added to the energy pipeline, enough to power 3 million homes. Renewable energy helps the environment. It means lower bills for households and lower input costs for business. It also presents a defining opportunity for economic growth, the chance for Australia to be a renewable energy superpower. It's now crystal clear that the certainty provided by our legislated emissions reduction target has delivered a step change in investment. We're proud of this record, but we're not resting on it because we know that after a wasted decade, there is not a day to waste. 